Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Girl Dad Show. I'm super excited today because I have a uh, first time in The Girl Dad Show history, both the parent and the kid on the show today. So let's jump right in and get to know our guest. Abigail, do you want to share who you are and a little bit about yourself before we pass it over to Alex? Yeah, sure. So I'm Abigail. I am 23 and Alex Ferris. I'm currently graduating in May with my master's in clinical mental health counseling. I work as a therapist. I work in food service. I do a whole bunch of things. I'm currently writing research and I'll be published by the end of the summer. What else do I have going on? That's basically me. Um, I'm a Scorpio. So <laughs> nice. I love it. That's a great intro. Alex, I have a bunch of questions for you, Abigail, but Alex, why don't you introduce yourself so we can get this interview started? Hi, I'm, I'm Abigail's dad or Abedad in some forms. I'm very proud of her. She's amazing. Um, my birthday is two days off of hers, so I, I'm sort of Scorpio Libra. Not that I usually state that. <laughs> I'm trained as a scientist. I, I um, run a venture fund now. I I like to help companies find their way through the, the maze that is trying to get massive adoption in healthcare, and it's going pretty good. I run a company called MedStar. Yeah. And how'd you get into becoming a venture capitalist, Alex? Can you walk us through a little bit more on that? Sort of an accident. I mean, it's like my 10th career, but uh, I had started uh, four or five companies and uh, was going to go crowdfund the fourth one, which I had started when the kids were finally, when they went to school, into kindergarten, I think. Anyway, and so I went to go crowdfund it, and then after a little while, we saw that the company Companies that got crowdfunded were also much more likely to get venture funded or have exits and things yeah. like that. So I started reading books on how to do venture capital. I'd been around it a lot from doing the startups and from doing M&A work when I was a kid. But, you know, the actual doing of it is different. And, and, you know, so we've been doing it for seven years now. It's the best job in the world. And we get to help lots of people that affect millions of people with their new ideas. And uh, it's just, it's very... Uh, it feels good to have a lot of impact and to be able to sort of just give a little help to a lot of companies getting going that are going through stuff for the first time that I've been through 10 times and the ways you can drive adoption. So it's super fun. That is awesome. I love that you taught yourself through reading books. That's that's a really funny, funny way of learning a new and job. And making a lot of mistakes too. Yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> like a true entrepreneur. I love it. Um, and then Abigail, do you know, how do you explain to your friends what your uh, dad does for a living? So that's always a really fun conversation. Yeah. I typically have a spiel that I go off of. I yeah. So like my dad is CEO of a crowdfunding company that crowdfunds medical innovations and they help, you know, with advocacy in a sense, because it's like you're putting new ideas out there onto a platform that maybe they wouldn't have had the same outreach and the same ability to be known about. And he goes all around the country and he even goes to Colombia doing these events and he runs these events. So I just kind of say that he's like CEO of his own company. CEO of his own company. I like it. That's good. Go, uh, so you go, go small and then you go wide and then you go back to CEO of his own company. Yeah, just that. You know, my, she my <laughs> when did you, did you, what business were you at, Alex, when you had Abigail? Like, when was that process happening? Uh, what believe business not, were you at? Was it number two, number three? Walk us through the timeline here a little. So, believe it or not, I was actually in women's clothing at the time. You know, what do so you mean? The fashion, the fashion industry. Okay. Was, <laughs> yeah, I was like, like wait, what? <laughs> That's awesome. I just, I just like to play with words. So, Me yeah, too. you know, so so when the kids were little, her mom, who was a doctor, really wanted to, you know, be a stay-at-home mom. And so, I took a job running somebody else's company for about eight years and, you know, to live a nice lifestyle and things like that. And, you know, provided a lot of stability when the kids were little. And, uh, you know, it was a re really wonderful period of my life. But um, but that ended in 2000, and I started doing startups again. It's a lot harder. It's like having another child, you know. Um, yeah, very demanding and things like that. So I had started a company called Fair Care, which was like a price line for healthcare. Mm -hmm. And then we weren't making enough money. So we went to a crowdfund and you know, the next six servers we needed accidentally started a crowdfunding site that took off. And so we just mm -hmm. switched the team over to the crowdfunding site. And then pretty soon people are asking us to run these crowdfunding contests. When I say people, I mean like GE, Department oh, of wow. Services, American Heart Association. So we had like yeah. 57 clients. Yeah. You know, asking us to run contests, you know, a huge one for the American Medical Association. But then it was like five years after that, that I figured out that, hey, if we had in these companies that were taking off after they won one of our contests or did one on the site. So, I mean, that's sort of like the evolution of how it went from stable inside job, doing operations, six yeah. programs, things like that, which I mean, I loved, I loved pretty much every job I've had that it's just wonderful people to work with, but it didn't, but clothing honestly is not as impactful. It doesn't matter as much to me as doing research or helping some new idea and get out to millions of people. Yeah. So just, just start my timeline here. So you took a 
CEO job in a women's apparel company. No, it was vice president of operations. Vice so, president of operations. So about a third of the people work for me. In a women's apparel company to basically create a, a partnership. Stable home environment. Yeah, yeah. where a where, mom um, could stay home and be a stay-at-home mom. That's awesome. Yeah. And then that's that was like basically through about eight or nine years old, Abigail. And then... Yeah. And then your dad started going off on the deep end on entrepreneurship again. And that is like, yeah. the phrase. Can you? Because, well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm well, an entrepreneur no, I, myself, so I definitely know the, the crazy you have to have to go do that from a stable job. Well, look, your, your partner, your spouse doesn't sign up for that necessarily. That's right. And I've seen more startup divorces than I never thought it would happen to me. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard on the relationship. It's also hard on the kids. I mean, because the reality is the kids don't sign up for it either. I'd 100%. love to hear your point of view, Abigail. What was your thoughts when your dad went from being the vice president of operations for this stable job to starting his own company? Abigail, do not hold anything back. You're allowed to say that. <laughs> dad, dad, dad we, ruined our family. We put her on camera. It's too late for that, Alex. We're already here. She's going to love this. I'll be honest. I can I know. take it. So I was about like eight or nine. So it was like, two, and I remember just, you know, seeing everything kind of fall apart. And like, I had a younger brother who's four. And I remember when mom and dad would fight and how like bad it would get. And they were physical, just, you know, loud. And this was new for me. And I kind of took my brother and we would go in my room and we'd play games and I would distract. All their silver linings and everything, I think. My brother and I, Spencer, are thick as thieves. We go to each other for everything. Mm. And it was really, it was difficult i will say because not a lot of people around me like my friends no one's parents fought no one really or if they did it wasn't going to impact the kids there was a lot of discrepancy in rules i think in the household there were times where well let me just put this out here i'm very stubborn mm. my dad is pretty stubborn yeah he is <laughs> <laughs> And my mom is also very stubborn. You can't stubborn. leave your mom out of that. She's oh, she's stubborn too? too. Yeah. Okay, you're painting the picture well, Abigail. I got it. I we're was not expecting stubborn. the mom to also be stubborn, but I, I got the gist now. Keep going. We're all very stubborn. And, you know, I was like 13, like moving forward. I was 13. I don't know if like you've ever met an angsty 13-year-old girl who was emo <laughs> and have. like black <laughs> sheep, you know? They, they said, like, specifically my dad, like, if he said, okay, you need to do this, I'd be like, I'm absolutely not doing that. Mm. Like, absolutely not. Not. We would have fights about school and like math, specifically math. I thought it was cool to not like math. Mm. And I remember being downstairs at the blackboard and like he's trying to teach me like algebra. And I'm like, I don't need algebra. I don't want it. I don't need it. I don't want to be good at math. Um, Do you remember what I said? And it was just very frustrating for everyone involved. Um, you. Do, you, do you remember what I, I, I said at that... the time? What? Remember my response to your lack of interest in math at the time? Something about, like, it would, like, come back to me and, like, bite me in the ass. At the time, I said, you become what you pretend to be. So, I pretend to not be good at math and science, and I fall behind, and by the time you realize it, I'll be behind. Yeah, and, and, and I'm and... glad that, like, I didn't let that happen, and you didn't let that happen. And, like, my... I said you. It definitely happened. Uh... You know, you said to me several years later that... Uh, but now I got to catch up. But well, did. yeah, it happened, you but did. it didn't go into college. It didn't go into the rest of my academic career and my life. I mean, like, I'm graduating with a master's in science now, so it's like, obviously, it didn't go that far. But I think that there was constantly, like, tension in the household. Like, you could cut it with a knife. Um, and it, for a while, I know my brother and I were like, oh, is this our fault? Is this our fault? But I think something that's really important, like, to remind your kids is, like, it's not their fault. It never typically is. Yeah. It's some adult stuff that's going on. And regardless, I remember telling Spencer, I'm like, no, you're golden. I'm like, you didn't do anything wrong. This is between them. It doesn't regard us. We, but I think none, it does. Nonetheless, well. they get caught in a crossfire a lot and get weaponized. And such a thing as the child's bill of right, you know, which is things that you're not supposed to do. And I think, you know, if, if people listening are you know, doing startups or having issues in the home, just always respect, you know, you know their right to be not involved in that argument. And I, I don't know that I'm pretty sure we didn't succeed at that, but uh, yeah, but, but yeah, that's just definitely like a, a don't, you know, don't involve the kids. Alex, I have then to, you, I have to try. Oh, go ahead. Again. I was just going to say, then you have kids like me who I would insert myself sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, I'm very stubborn. If I was like doing something and I didn't want to hear it anymore, I'd be like, can you just like stop? Like, please stop i would come down and i start yelling but i think that like honestly you know it depends on the kid like obviously it's not good to involve your kids into like they pop up like that but if you have a kid that's like me who is like i'm not like dealing with this anymore and i was like also like 16 at the time so it's a little different
on. Get on. Yeah, ultimately, it was Abigail, to Abigail's credit, she's the one who wound up mediating the final resolution. Um, no kidding. Yeah. She came How did from, you do? She came back from college. She sat her mom down, and I had been capitulating. And she sat her mom down and said, Mom, this isn't good. This has to end. And that's when it really started to end. So this was all a few years ago? It, it was, was like 20, 2018. 2018. 20, yeah. Okay, so about five years ago. Previous process, the start, Alex, was it actually because you wanted to be an entrepreneur again? Or what was the root? What was the root start? Is that, is that what you're alluding to? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so I'm I, curious. I started, I started a fair care and to the end, it was Priceline for healthcare. And I was getting a lot of traction, but it wasn't making a lot of money. Hence the crowdfunding project. And then MedStarter takes off and we're making money with MedStarter from day one. So mm -hmm. financially, the family was doing good. Hey. But, you know, I can't speak for the whole situation, but it was because I did not go back to going, you know, doing a day job that my spouse at the time was very upset with me all the time so uh, she blamed my you know life choices but you know but here's the thing if you are motivated by impact and driven to do things you know it's not that i don't like working for other people it's that i want to do things that really matter to me and this is this really mattered because you're helping hundreds of companies you know get funding and drive awareness as abigail was saying and it was really important to me and it felt like what I wanted to do the rest of my life. I didn't want to go back to running operations for a clothing company or doing some sort of logistics job, things like that. And we had enough money and I threw myself a retirement party at 38 because we had two thirds of everything we needed to retire with as far as I was concerned. And I had 10 more years to make a couple more million dollars and this seemed like a good way to do it. But it also made my spouse very upset. Um, yeah, I could see how that those decisions were basically the fissure. It sounds like that's kind of like where it started. Um, how do you how do you think about this, Alex? As you think about like being a dad and having your like adult daughter kind of, kind of like talk about this stuff, like what does that make we you talk think about it feel? all the time? I mean, honestly, I mean, she is she and her mother are both some of the most amazing empathetic psychologists you'll ever meet. Mm. Right? And Abigail has talked to us through situations in ways that just astound me. So yeah, so we talk about this all the time. So I'm not at all surprised by what Abigail said. Mm. And I think we've done the work. I mean, you know, I get along fine with her mom these days. I think we all survived this. And also, I think that life without hardship, um, you know, without challenges, it doesn't make interesting people. And I have two extremely interesting children mm -hmm. who I love dearly. I'm very proud of. But I think, you know, that was does not really makes you stronger. And yes, it was not easy growing up in that household. But like Abigail says, there are silver linings. Yeah. Abigail, what do you think about as like, success for you what are you looking for are you like what are the, some of the core things that you'd love to accomplish in your life so i really want to get my doctorate and in clinical psychology or a psyd i think my whole life goal is i have three things i want to do i want to teach collegiately psychology i want to see clients as a therapist and i want to do research i like having multiple things to do so currently i'm doing two of those three things with my master's i mean the third one teaching i just think it's really important to teach the next generation about you know the field that they're going into and i enjoy teaching i think that it's essential for especially in this field of psychology counseling it's still a blossoming field so like actually right before i was i came on the podcast i was writing a paper and it's on ketamine assisted therapy combined with gestalt therapy so it's like taking fringe new age things like that and putting the research behind it I'm really into that kind of thing. I'm into the use of psychedelics for like therapeutic benefits, things that are more accessible rather than, you know, using very like outdated medications like Thorazine for, you know, treatment of things like schizophrenia because it's just not conducive to quality of life. And I think mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I want to help people. Mm -hmm. I want to be there with them. I know what it feels like to feel alone. I know what hurt feels like. And I don't want people to be alone and feel like they have no one that they can talk to or turn to. I currently see seven people for therapy and I've been with them since about September. I'm still very new in this field. I really enjoy it though and a big range of ages I see. I see my youngest client is 16 and my eldest is like 50. And I also do testing for psychological and neurological testing. So awesome. I would, I would correct one thing, Abigail. You you are a teacher already. I mean, you teach me. I see you teaching your friends. And but um no, but so I, I think that while you're not being paid to teach at this point, I think that you've become a great teacher, especially compared to how you were when you were twelve and you'd like you know make fun of me for not understanding the difference between pitch and tones. Yeah, it's also really interesting how clearly you've uh, come to the conclusion of what success looks like for you, at least for the next like uh, foreseeable future which is fantastic
fantastic because I could tell you right now when I was in my 20s, I had no answer like that. That could be emphatically, I'll put money on that. I can almost guarantee you that I had no answer close to that in uh, my 20s. So that is very interesting. Alex, what do you think of success for Abigail and Spencer? What What do you want from them? Like, what would well, you think? I think? I think better than food and, you know, ride on a carousel, anything. I think what feels the best in my life, and I know that they know this already, is impact. When you do something and it actually has a wide ranging effect. So that's what, when I say why I love what I do now, it's because I help one company with a watch that can tell your glucose, whatever. And that could be a platform whereby 500 million people could understand how to make themselves healthier through eating better by having real time information. So that's just like one of the companies we invested in and a company that spent a lot of time helping and, you know, trying to push forward in the right direction. They're actually doing a pilot right now with 50 patients. It's going well. But my point is, is that success to me is being able to help a thousand of those ideas get out further and market faster so that we can help everybody in the world live longer and healthier lives or as long as they want to, you know, which is becoming a reality, you know. So I, so working on medical innovation and helping helping improve how healthcare works and better treatments, better diagnosis, mm -hmm. better better care. Do you want that for your kids as well? Or are you saying that you want that for yourself, for your the world oh, that you're creating sorry, for your sorry. kids? I, I oh, you're fine. I, I'm totally, I'm totally curious as to both of those answers so, uh, oh, I'm so glad what, do I, what do i want for them yeah i, I want them to be happy and mm -hmm. if impact like this makes them happy then that's awesome if you like building bridges you know whether they're mental or physical because that's what my mm -hmm. kids are headed towards right and mm -hmm. is mental health and my son is doing engineering um and if you like to make things if you like to you know, help people get through stuff one of abigail's biggest things is helping young girls with ptsd and doing research with that um and, you know, so mission-driven life is, is wonderful. Even if they chose to go down a hedonistic path, it made them happy. That's all I really want. Hmm. That's interesting. Abigail, what do you think about that? I mean, I think my whole life I was always told I can do whatever I put my mind to. Hmm. Um, by both of my parents. But my dad would always be like, you want to do this? Okay, like, that, whatever I wanted to do, that creativity or that idea I had was always fostered. And I'm really grateful for that because I know a lot of people don't necessarily get that with their parents. And I've always been told I can do whatever I put my mind to. I never really saw anything. I guess, like, the biggest blockade is, you know, just time um, of wanting to do everything all at once. And I cannot say how, like, grateful I am for that. Is I've met people who are like, oh, I've been shut down by my parents saying like, oh, I won't be able to make it in this. I won't be able to do this. Mm. I was never told that really. And that's and something. That's, that's a gift. That's a gift from your grandmother. And my, yeah. That's what she always told us. And I it, mean, it is a great. I think being told that starting from a really young age is really impactful. And I know that it's a unique experience and I appreciate it because I've spoken to so many of my friends and my colleagues and they were told like, oh, my parents think that it's stupid. I'm going into mental health counseling. It doesn't align with their beliefs. And it was always like, no, if you want to do that, if you feel passionate about it, do it. Do it. Thanks. One of the proudest things I can say, so I blew your side up at Binghamton when we did a Seder did a test for Abby on her. And so I meet her friends and they're repeating my standard tropes that I would tell her. And they would call them like Abigail's dadisms or something. Anyway, oh, yeah. so the idea that, that this could be passed on through that they had so gotten into her head and that they were so part of her that, and that I guess that they inspired her. Very interesting, very smart friends. Um, you know. So to me, that made me very proud. Yeah, it's awesome. And then as it relates to like success for the family now, as I don't know what the situation is currently, but can you guys walk in thing with successful it's like, and is it working? What's good? What's going good? What's not? I'd love okay, to hear Abigail, from Alex first, on, please. On the count of three, Abigail, you and I are going to say the first word that it comes to us, right? Ready? Yeah, One. like the family. Just the first word that popped into your head when, when Young asked the question. So ready? One, two, three. Spencer. <laughs> No, but come on, Abigail. Didn't that occur to you that, you know, success for the family is, I mean, obviously I could say Abigail, but you're right here. But the, the one thing that, so, so when, when her little brother went off to college, Abigail and I, our, our relationship was messed up for a while, you know, from like 13 to the, and, um, and you know, we, and so I had moved out when she was like 19, 18, no, I should 17. 18. No, you're still 17. It was October. Anyway, but this is how we are. But so, 
Um, and even after I had moved out and you know, she wouldn't visit. So then Spencer goes off to college and, you know, we both think that the, we were raising him. You know, we both think that, that we were taking care of him, right? He's four years younger than Abigail. And so he leaves. And then suddenly Abigail and I see each other like, what, twice a week? I have to yeah. throw her out of my apartment at like three in the morning and say, Abigail, I gotta get some sleep. Because, mm. you know, once we get talking, I mean, we're, we're, we're you know like-minded similar people oh wow yeah we can talk all night wait this is this is after you turned 18 and you started reconnecting again or after spencer went off to after college. spencer went to college which was like two years ago so i was 20 21 it was right after i had essentially graduated undergrad and i was back home because i graduated well, well Long island i was back what island. what happened i mean yeah, like what was the switch that made you want to reconnect and build that relationship back again I think for me, like, I needed space to process things. And I think that I still was angry and sad and hurt because it's hard seeing, like, the two biggest influences in your childhood, your mom and your dad, fight. And it hurts to see that because you love them both and you know that, like, they've hurt each other. And you kind of, there's a level of guilt and frustration that comes with wanting to foster a relationship sometimes because it's like, you hurt someone that I love. Like, you hurt someone that I care about and that I still care about. But I think regardless of age, you're always is gonna want a relationship with your parents if you know they didn't do something absolutely heinous to you you know what i mean like um That's but i think yeah. I, I was gonna it just depends my, on the person i think wife, i was speaking I, for I, myself i'm not gonna speak for like everyone else in the universe because that's not a fair generalization and i was home and you know there were a lot of reminders of how things were and i think the nostalgia kicked in and i think i missed that relationship with my dad and you know, I think that becoming an adult, part of it is learning how to move forward and forgive and create new relationships. Because one thing that happened 10 years ago isn't the end all be all relationship, especially when I was still growing as a human being. Like, my brain isn't fully developed yet, technically. 26, that's when it's fully developed. Like, you know, I may or may not. Uh, you're it. still evolving. And Abigail's wherever's worth. I mean, you don't know me from a stick in the mud, but you're going to keep growing and evolving, even without the medical 26 year old thing. Like, I promise you, yeah. there's a lot about my parents becoming a parent. And I'm still learning about my parents. They evolve as a 43 year old man, right? Like, learning so much about my parents through just the experiences. So, I never feel like, you know, you have to ask. You know, stop evolving and make something that's a decree, a decree forever to keep learning and growing. I think that's amazing. And so, can I ask though? Just I'm, I'm just I'm just very nosy right now because I'm very curious about this story. Having both of you here, so were you kind of ignoring both parents or just Alex, just your dad? It was just my dad. Oh, okay, well, like spill the tea, girlfriend. What, what was that all about? <laughs> why why just why just your dad? Because I we. <laughs> I think my dad and I are very similar and it led us to butt heads more. So we would get nasty, horrible, horrible fights. Like I specifically about what? sometimes stupid things. Really dumb. Like, I remember like dumb one... shit. Totally dumb shit. Like he told me I didn't know how to vacuum or something like that. What? <laughs> As if you ever vacuumed in my presence, let's be honest. <laughs> Doing it wrong, no, I remember this, and I wanted to throw. I think I threw the vacuum at you. Right. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like, I got into much more heated arguments with my dad than I did my mom. Mm -hmm. uh, I did get into bad arguments with my mom that did not, not happen, but it was also kind of like I don't know. My dad and I always kind of fought, or we knew how to poke each other's buttons in a different way. Um, I think that's because of the similarities more than anything. So I think I summarized it well in a song that I wrote called I Want to Die in February, which is a funny song. But um, so, I mean, I'll read you a little bit of it, but it really explains it. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a funny song. I know, it's, it is funny. <laughs> I want to die in funny. February in a not so sunny day. I want to die in February in some not so special way. All my friends will be around. Anyway, so it goes on. And uh, but, So, you know, I want my children to be sad, but I'll be satisfied because a boy only truly be becomes a man when his father dies. It's a little dark. And to my daughter, oh so fierce, she's the one who cares. Her burning flame, it's so bright. Her anger's gonna flare. Let's nip that in the bud. Let's do that in the song. You know I always tried my best, but too often got it wrong. I hope you do it better, make everything all right, and forgive me for my faults. Cause when two are so the same, of course they're gonna fight. Hey. I know that of you, I am oh so proud. Always know that's true. A better daughter I couldn't wish. My greatest gift to the world is you. Anyway, so, but I think that kind of summarizes it, right? I mean, we're similar yeah. and we're going to butt heads, you know, and when two people, as she said, you know, that you care about deeply, you know, love, fight, you know, picking a side is a safe choice, you know, and 
at the end of the day, I wanted her to be comfortable. So I realized that I was, you know, not winning the battle of Abigail, but I also thought we're not fighting over Abigail. So I did not try to Press recognize it. her. I tried to defend myself sometimes, but usually I just accepted it. But going back to why we glommed back together, after Spence left, I put a lot more of my time and energy above into my son. It's not that I didn't love Abigail, but she wouldn't let me. So when he left, you know, and I had been trying to patch things up with Abigail for years, but uh, when he left, I think that created sort of a vacuum for both of us because we both had done that. Mm. Um, and then, so then we realized, hey, there's each other again. So I was very happy that she started coming back. It's a beautiful story. I love it. I have to keep crying though. I'm sorry. How are y'all? What are your general thoughts on divorce in general? And like any like pieces of advice for, you know, entrepreneurs out there kind of going through this kind of problem from a kid and kid and child perspective? From a kid and child perspective and also with the lens as a clinical mental health counselor. Sure. Divorce is extremely common. Something about 50% of marriages end in divorce. And if you're a child of divorce, it increases your chances as well of having a divorce because you didn't have that stability. I think being aware of these things and transparent, effective communication, which honestly is very difficult because no one really teaches us how to communicate our wants, needs, and desires. Mm -hmm. That, doing that with your partner, because there's a level of stability that I feel is required in a partnership and a family. There's a level of security that's needed because something, I don't know, I think it was like kids cost like a million dollars. Like to have one kid that costs a million dollars. I think that number's higher now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, still, even it's more if it's already, yeah. Like that is poor <laughs> to me. Yeah. I can't even like fathom it. But I think trying to communicate your wants and needs and communicate to your kids that, you know, this isn't about that. Like at the end of the day, like they are not the problem. There is a change in someone's life plan or goals or something that they wanted, like the mother or the father, whoever, or the dad and the dad and the mom and the mother, whoever. In the parents, there was a, like a schism in that relationship and it had nothing to do because like the kids are bad or whatever. And I also think the age at which it happens, like for the kids, like say like they're young, like eight and four, like my brother and I, it's gonna, that conversation's gonna look different than if the kids are like 14 and 16. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying hold off on a divorce. Like do not try to make ends meet if it's really not going to work. I think it saves a lot of time, energy, and frustration to rip the band-aid off and in my own personal life i'm horrified of divorce i'm horrified and thinking that i have this person in my life who's gonna be my forever person and then just one day it's not gonna work out anymore hey. it's scary to me and also my partner his parents are divorced as well so you know our odds are not in our favor mm -hmm. uh if we're talking statistics wise but i think going in being aware of your flaws and like the fact that like something that i'm aware of is like i have a short fuse i have anger issues knowing that and knowing that I have to step away and walk out of that, whether you're in a relationship or you're married, like knowing that and how to pass the people around you is essential for, I guess, avoiding divorce. And even if divorce does happen, how to mitigate the fallout. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing. I like just to switch gears a little bit. Anything you would tell yourself before you started this business? Like if you give yourself one piece of advice, like if you could go do that, like would you tell yourself something? Yeah, make sure you prove the revenue model first. <laughs> <laughs> I really wrote a 54 page business plan before I started Fair Care. I analyzed the whole market. I thought that I had it all figured out. Yeah. But my original plan for how to make money with it, not so good. Later got plan was, was great. And I still think that that model worked, but yeah. I kind of got sidetracked and started doing other stuff. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, with respect to the, the fatherhood thing, you know, you know, maybe, maybe I should have just gotten a straight job, you know, mm -hmm. back into the, when it started and life would have been simpler and the kids would have been happier. So, but I don't know if I would have, I'm not known for listening. You know, literally in my wedding, that was, I think I wrote that I would love on and listen. And my entire side of the family just laughed you know, <laughs> because they know that. I know. So, so I think if I did tell myself something like that, I'd probably tell myself to fuck off. <laughs> So it's awesome. I, I appreciate you sharing that. And that it's also hard to, uh, be life. Oh, you about things like that. I appreciate you answering that. Cause you definitely don't seem the type to like really fester too much on, you know, regrets. Right. And trying to figure out how to make things better in the future. The little that I met you and know about you, you seem very uh, forward thinking and bullish. Right. And so I appreciate you sharing. I want to ask a couple more questions just to kind of uh, tighten the show here. Show uh, here. I like to ask the same questions for all my guests. Um, but I do want to hit some of those out. So, um, I got most of the questions I want to ask, but I do want to ask what your favorite book is. I do like to know what everyone's favorite book is. So if you guys could both share what your favorite book is, that'd be awesome. That's you far. First yeah, there's so many. I mean, there's the, so many. I, I read a I, lot. I think my current favorite book right now might be The Sphere. Yeah. Oh, I really cool. Like the science fiction one. Great. 
That was yeah, a great that's one. me, Mickey. Reads. I'm also a big horror junkie, so nice. I'm reading The Hollow Ones right now by Guillermo del Toro, and also Tender is the Flesh, nice. which is written Classic. by I don't remember the author's name, but I'm reading those two books right now. There you go, really Alex. Good. What do you got? What's your favorite book? I'm so literary wise lately i literally read I went behind. <laughs> no no I, I read a new book every 37 hours for nine months because my eyes went and i couldn't read and then suddenly i found library audiobooks and oh my god so having a lot of fun with that but my favorite thing i've read lately i mean if you asked me before i would have said something like atlas shrugged or something like that but, oh, good yeah. ones, grandpa's favorite. that was great that was grandpa's favorite book but yes that, yeah, that lives book. rent free in my head forever but yeah, my, my favorite book that i've read last night months 10 months was called the spider and the starfish and it explains a lot of the things that i've been kind of doing but also how the world works in a way that i hadn't really thought about before so for example the reason the conquistadors didn't make it up into the southwest the american southwest is because the apache indians were so unlike montezuma that they could trap and kill and trick you know the uh, mines aztecs with you know you couldn't do that to the apaches because there was no leader so if you think about how hamas or isis or what have you work or what the you know, it is successful against unlikely odds because they can always just reform and attack again. And I know this is a terrible thing to say about terrorist organizations, but, you know, the American Revolution succeeded for a similar oh, reason, right? Because they did guerrilla warfare. Anyway, so, but if you apply this to business and in life in general, if you enable, you know, an infrastructure to enable a lot of chiefs to rise and to do a lot of important things, it has a much greater likelihood of, of driving vast change. So anyway, so it's, it's an old book from 2000. I just found it the other day. A friend of mine introduced me to the idea. And it, and it really just gave me a nomenclature to sort of explain how things can be done massively at scale against all odds. It's awesome. Which is exactly what I like. Yeah, well, that's kind of what you're doing with MedStarter. It's very, very parallel to that because you're not just trying to create one, you know, golden exactly. ticket. You're trying, to, you're trying to create a system. Example. Yeah, trying to create a system that creates more of them. Yeah. Um, like awesome. Podcast like this. Yeah. Let me let me bring us home. So both of you guys, if you can share something that you guys do on your downtime, I'll be doing an out thing, getting your masters and doing research and teaching and Alex, so you're not I try to the world through digital innovation and investing. Investing. But what do you guys do for fun? What's your downtime activities? Um. So I currently don't have a lot of downtime right now because I'm in finals. But I will <laughs> say I really, really enjoy art and drawing and painting. Um. You can't tell, but I have a lot of tattoos. Mm. Um. So I really do enjoy getting tattoos. Show your tattoos. Yeah, show us one. Show, show us the bunny in the room. So, hey, while, while she's doing I have, Oh, wow, um, that's big. I have. Oh, wow, that's the cool. Chrome, and then I'm going back up. Oh, you're on so you, like, have tattoos. Right. You don't have, like, a tattoo. I you have, like, tattoos. tattoos. <laughs> you're, like, a yeah. full sleeve. Like, do you? At least, at least one is horrifying. I'd like to see one. Snake um, <laughs> for the, the skull with a knife. The skull with the knife? <laughs> <laughs> when she got that, I was like, Abby, go, really? <laughs> she's that like to. <laughs> Yeah. Oh wow! Oh, there yeah, is. yeah, there it is. So Thank metal, sharing, yeah. so metal. Yeah. And, yeah, and I do when when there's a good show in town. Like I love heavy metal. That's actually how I met my boyfriend. Was at a heavy metal concert. Oh wow! I was crowd surfing and he caught me. So my dad and I actually have gone to a show together. <laughs> Wait, to a heavy metal concert? concert? Yeah, we went to two. Oh we went wow, to that's awesome! I wouldn't know. Like, would you can? It's not heavy metal. It was raw. We went to. Guns I don't know what you call that. Yeah. Movie, but yeah. This was actually at the Guns N' Roses concert. Oh, nice. Yeah, so, so we went to Guns N' Roses. Roses, and then we went to one of my favorite bands, Ice Nine Kills. It was really good. It was really fun. Can I can I preamble this? Yeah. So, so when she was a baby, I used to sing her to sleep, and I used to sing her this song. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. And never mind that voice you heard. It's just the beast under her bed. In your closet, in your head. Mm. She still can't sleep. She made me take the doors off her closet <laughs> every night. And she turned into a metalhead. So, yes. Oh, so for her baby. 23rd birthday, I said, what do you want to do? What's, let's drive to Detroit and go see Metallica. And she said, no, I'd really go see Ice Tank. And so yeah, this is also how she that. saved my life. So we're in the mosh pit. People are starting to crowd surf over us. I think we both got kicked in the head. We laughed. And someone got a little bit separated. But I had been fasting for like 53 hours. It was like after I think I was trying to go back to my low weight and project for me. And I started to feel really bad. And so I just as I reach out to Abigail to say, Abigail, I got to go sit down. I pass out in the mosh pit. This one, which you can't tell here, but she's not even five feet tall. Thanks. Yes. And, you know, sees this happen, you know, and fall face down 
turns me over. She starts to do CPR, sees that I'm not dead, but it's really not clear because my eyes are open and I'm unresponsive. And then she stands over me and she had bruises and cuts and scrapes and, and just fought everybody off until security. And then, you know, it wasn't working and I guess she was getting overwhelmed. And so she screamed so loud, they stopped the music and turned on the lights. A heavy, ma- this is at the Hammerstein Ballroom. Wow. So I, you know, how often do you say your daughter saved your life? Well, not, not only that, but the fact that you have that much uh, decibel control in your voice, you should have been a heavy yeah, metal singer in there. So this is the, 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 the. Hey, There's your fourth calling, Abigail, right there. I want you to go oh, check the vocal cord out on a metal oh, band for me, dude. Saving hey. my dad from stupidity. Okay. Hey. Exactly. Piercing the veil through sound volume. Um, yeah. yeah. And then, Alice, do you know what you're sharing real quick? What do you next to during your downtime? A lot lately I've been writing poetry. They're actually songs and then turning them into actual music. So I started doing some jam sessions, trying to find other musicians. But I'm not a musician. Both of my kids are great musicians. I don't know that. I probably their mom's fault. So yeah, so that, and I just went back to Manhattan. So all sorts of shenanigans here. Yeah. Of course, time with family. Are you, are you coming to Passover, Abigail? Passover was literally last week. You know that. No, it's a whole week, Abigail. <laughs> it's, 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 I'm working. I literally have worked tonight at 5.50. I'll take that as a no. <laughs> That's pretty much par for the course. But we are grabbing Spencer and we're going up to... Anyway, so... Uh, yeah. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story. This was super fun for me. Uh, it's the first time I've ever done this and it was really, really enjoyable. And uh, I appreciate your time and your honesty and transparency. And I just wanted to thank you guys for being so vulnerable and sharing your story. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Yeah, young, you do a great job of this. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon, okay? Bye, guys. Take care, young.